Hi, uh, greetings from Silicon Valley. I'm Frodo Odegaard, and I'm going to do a quick teaser talk about the post-industrial transition and some of the challenges that it provides and that, that we have to deal with. Um, this will just be an introduction to what the post-industrial transition is about. Um, for more detail, um, you'll have to attend my, my in-depth session that comes after this. Now, um, this is a quick introduction to the Post-Industrial Institute. We are a research and advisory firm. Um, we are focused on developing new management thinking and tools and new policy thinking related to the, this post-industrial transition, which I'll be talking about. We're based in Silicon Valley, and we also have an office in London, and we work with with corporate leaders, investors, especially private equity, corporate venturing, um, and also policymakers and a few founders as well. So um, I want to start off by mentioning something that's really inspired me, um, which is that this year, this fall, was the moment in human history when space travel and space tourism, to be more specific, went from being the stuff of science fiction or you know, sort of hype to becoming something that looks more like reality. That means that we have reusable technology components. We are able to develop these solutions for you know, space-based products and services um, in a way that we just haven't been able to do in previous decades. And I think that's something we all should appreciate. And we should think of that as a very powerful example of what happens when you have exponential technology development in a variety of fields, variety of technologies, which if you are um, running a larger company, or if that matter, if you are on the disruptor side, you're a founder, um, you're probably spending some amount of time thinking about what are the opportunities slash threats, depending on which side you are on, um, for these technologies in terms of how they're impacting your industries and, and maybe even spawning whole new industries. So um, what we think is happening is that there is a virtuous cycle where you have increasing investment in developing these technologies because you can see, you see what they can do essentially. Um, and these technologies are deployed. They're used, um, deployed as part of or used in disruptive business models. There are um, uh, improving industries, reshaping industries, and also causing some societal upheaval. And which I think we need to talk about. Um, and also besides creating more value for customers, there is um, an additional reward, which is improved capital efficiency. And that of course frees up resources to invest further in developing exponential technologies and so on. Now there's a counter cycle here as well. And that's where you have industry incumbents and you have policymakers, regulators, um, who are using um, essentially a form of, of, I think of it as digital protectionism, and the EU is a good example of this, to, to keep really you know, disruptive startups, disruptive outside, outsiders from uh, affecting the you know, more conservative established industries in your uh, jurisdiction. And there's quite a bit of that going on in the United States as well. And so there's always been this sort of battle between the incumbents wanting to write the rules and, and, and hoping politicians will help protect them from innovation and, and disruptors, which are not only startups, but also large, larger companies are just acting sooner than you are on taking advantage of new technology. So here's a, a quick clip as a, an example of societal upheaval from a protest in Paris that took place three, four years ago. Police in Paris clashed with protesting taxi drivers on Tuesday amid a day of major strike action across France. Some demonstrators threw tires and lit fires on the ring road surrounding the French capital. The cab drivers have been demonstrating against app-based firms such as Uber, which they say are unfairly undercutting their business. And of course, um, Uber is disrupting the taxi industry. It's a classic example of an industry that was protected by regulation, also by mindset, where one was assuming that this is the way that industry was always going to function. Well, that's all ending now, of course. Um, and the classical way of thinking about the relationship between people and organizations, 
uh, which you can go back to Karl Marx, you know, thinking of workers as being in opposition to companies, that's also coming to an end. And so now millennials, post-millennials are increasingly doing freelance work. Um, I think in the States, 50% of millennials are doing freelance work full-time or part-time. And that's expected to be 76% of the entire workforce as such by 2030. Um, there's a new um, segment, we call it the, the creator economy. There's 50 million people around the world who are doing some type of content creation, you know, graphics, newsletters, music, uh, software development, um, who are able to work independently because of the internet, because of new technology, um, and make a living full-time or, or part-time. And there's also a new movement of entrepreneurialism, of course, and you have startup ecosystems growing up far away from Silicon Valley. And um, so I'm, I'm very bullish on technology empowering people to create their lives um, in the pen of large organizations, large corporations. And if you ask young people today, 20 somethings, they are not interested in going to work for a big company for 10, 10 years, 15 years, not exciting. So uh, if we look at some of these trends that we can observe here, one of course is exponential technology development. And then you have shorter employee tenures. You know, in Silicon Valley, the average tenure for uh, employees and startups is 10.8 months. Um, you have shorter organizational lifespans. Credit Suisse did a nice report on, on the average age of S&P 500 listed companies and um, and how that's you know getting shorter and shorter. So it's, I think it's down to 15 years now. Um, and the layers, number of layers of management, what we call stratification, that's shrinking as well. And then we're starting to see also the emergence of decentralized manufacturing um, uh, with uh, you know 3D printing being sort of the first primitive version of what is to come. And that's affecting everything from you know production of spare parts, to household goods um, and, and even, even, even artwork. So, um, and there's also another uh, company I want to mention um, at Bright Machines. They're working on something they call micro factories, which are basically um, um, small manufacturing lines or cells, uh, which can be put into a, a room not much bigger than your living room and do all kinds of just in time assembly. Um, of products. So a lot of exciting stuff happening in manufacturing. And what we try to do is kind of look at the bigger picture, not just in scope and scale, but also over time. And back in 2014, when I started working on a lot of the thinking that led to what we're doing now, I spent a few months reading uh, economic history. And I looked at how um, going back to the, to the end of the Paleolithic, we've been on you know, on a journey of increasing our mastery over nature, adapting, adapting nature to our needs. And that's the yellow line you see there, that's technology development. And of course, since the 1970s with exponential progress in computing storage and communications capacity, um, um, that's, you know, now that's accelerated quite a bit. The, 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 the bottom um, uh, um, graph there is a representation of the degree of centralization. And so when we went from hunter-gatherers to agriculture, that was a movement in the, in the direction of centralization. And then we moved into cities in the Bronze Age. That's when a lot of the quote-unquote bureaucracy that we're used to used to run organizations was invented, you know, uh, writing systems and contracts and laws and lawyers and supply chain management, all of that was invented in the Bronze Age. Um, and then in the mid-90s, when we got the commercial internet, uh, it became possible to implement business models that separated people, decoupled, I should say, people and assets from firms. Um, and so think Uber, you know, labor utilization models, Airbnb, asset utilization models. And that was the beginning of rapid decentralization. So we never had that in a whole history of the species before this combination of exponential technology development on the one hand and rapid decentralization on the other hand. And we think I think that is an anthropological level event. That's why we talk about this as a transition to a new 
not just economy, but a new civilization, which is post-industrial civilization. And if you want to understand what, how technology is going to shape the future, management books can only do so much for you. And I say that as a management guy. So, so you really should read more science fiction. That's what I tell CEOs anyway. And so there's a trilogy I discovered when I started doing this work that really inspired me. It's called The Golden Acumen. And it was published by John Wright back uh, you know, 17, 18 years ago now. And he describes a post-industrial civilization with uh, machine intelligence. Uh, so there's no manual labor or repetitive knowledge work unless we want to. Absolute control of matter. So atomic precision level manufacturing. So control of both organic and in inorganic matter. Artificial life and indefinite lifespans as a corollary, as an extension of that. Um, uh, abundant energy whenever we need it, wherever we need it. And and colonization of the solar system. And he sets this 10,000 years into the future. And um, now that seems laughably pessimistic because if you look at this list of items, um, uh, you'll note that there are startups working on every one of these. So the, the future is really arriving way ahead of schedule. Um, so we have, we have a lot to be excited about. Now, in the context of management, what this means is it's not enough to go from Taylorism to agile or to lean thinking. We really have to think beyond. And I sat down back in 2014 and made a list of all the assumptions behind lean thinking, because I'd spent 10 years modernizing lean for knowledge work. And what I found was that for each of these different characteristics, whether it was looking for customer value, um, and so I call this post lean, which is a term that stuck for many years. We're now rebranding from the post lean to the post industrial institute, which is a much better name for what we're doing. Um, the, the scope really ex expanded from uh, products to, to looking at whole industries. Um, instead of thinking about strategy for the long term, we were really looking at how do we uh, spin up uh, just in time micro organizations. And of course, AI augmenting problem solving, enhancing collaboration. A lot of that problem solving work is being eaten by software. And then thinking in terms of um, networks, agile networks of short lived micro organizations with AI for coordination, distributed ledgers for secure um, coordination. Um, as opposed to just trying to keep these monolithic organizations alive for longer. Um, and with maximum uh, tenures, instead of the shorter tenure, maybe even maximum tenure. So you get max two years to accomplish something, then your time is up and you move on to your next thing. Um, we already talked about makers. And um, one exciting concept, which I'll talk about in my longer session, is the notion of higher order organizations, where you have organizations that are dedicated to starting up and spinning off new microorganizations, which are then valuable ventures. So the Institute is involved in a lot of different activities, asking questions and trying to produce answers to these various challenges. We're doing advisory work, of course, with uh, investors, corporate leaders, uh, policymakers, and some founders. Uh, we're doing a lot of independent research. We're doing some educational workshops. And this is not just to brag about what we've learned, but it's also to point out that we have a lot of questions ourselves about this. And that's why I'm interested in, in making this longer session as interactive as we can make it, because I want to hear what you think about all this stuff. We, we do have a, um, a, um, a forum, it's called the Post-Industrial Forum, where we arrange events. Uh, we have a talk show and so on, and we do conferences to get people together to discuss all of this. And I find that that this interactive discussion around these challenges is really what's helping us to kind of uh, ask questions we hadn't thought of asking, which is the first step towards uh, making progress and getting some insight. And then shortly we'll be uh, um, launching a quarterly uh, journal as well, which is more long form uh, sharing of our, of our insights and, and insights of others. Now, we, we do have a newsletter where you can get a digest of everything that we're learning. So just go to the URL at the bottom. Uh, but for today, I really hope that many of you will be able to attend this longer session uh, on the post-industrial enterprise. Um, and so I think we'll spend maybe 35 minutes or so with me summarizing some of our learning and then we'll, we'll have some Q&A for the rest of that uh, hour. So, so that should be uh, uh, enriching. Uh, I know it'll be enriching for me because I expect to learn a lot from the questions you asked uh, and I'm optimistic it will be for, your, uh, for you as well. So, Hope to see you there, and thank you very much for sitting in on the, on this uh, teaser talk. I hope I hope it worked, and hope to see you uh, in the other session. Thank you.